great, you truly are the great teacher, and we simply ask that you continue to do what you've been doing in our lives, and that's open the eyes of our understanding, bring to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of your role in our life, what Jesus really has done to fulfill the eternal plan that you, Father God, have established from before the foundations of the world. May we understand what the hope of our calling is. The calling where you called us sons and daughters. Before you called us what to do, you called us who we are. Be our teacher, be our guide, and our comforter. And all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. Uh, <laughs> Cheap way to pick up a cup. Uh, hallelujah. For those that have not been here before in one of these meetings, these are not our normal meetings. Uh, just to let you know what's going to happen, uh, the first half of this is what we call informational. There's just going to be a load of information uh, that's just dumped out. Uh, it's going to start in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, word 1. And it's going to go through the entire spectrum of the Bible. And uh, by no means is everything that we share all that's there, but there's so much more in Scripture than what we're going to share. You understand? But uh, there are some things in Scripture that we've learned over the years that has... Uh, made our journey a whole lot more colorful. And uh, <laughs> this is for you, Kurt. Yes, I see that. <laughs> Brad. I, I got my eyes out. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, again, this is not a doctrinal statement. Uh, we, Joy and I were teachers, and the role of a teacher is not to convince you what we know what we're talking about is right, but get you to think. To get, get that brain of ours moving so our heart has something to, to hold on to. and uh, God's a heart God. He's not a head God. Uh, and sometimes our heart gets empty because our head is so full and we don't tran make a transfer. And uh, our goal is not just to give you information, uh, our doctrine. Uh, we hope... Joy and I have a simple ministry. It's to make Jesus bigger in the revelation and the revelation of the uh, resurrection more effective. Uh, we need to be living in the resurrection. Does everybody understand that? We get our victory in the resurrection. Amen? And so that's our goal. Uh, please, uh, if you, uh, for those that are listening online, I know we have many online uh, waiting for this. As a matter of fact, for you that are here, we've invited those that have followed us over the years and uh, to go get barbecue and eat barbecue when we eat barbecue. So when, when we break, they're going to break. And trying to make this a corporate thing going on. So, But uh, again, it's not to create doctrine or theology. Our goal is to magnify Jesus. It's that simple. Please don't. Uh, if you have questions, please hold them, write them down. Uh, I, we're going to be going quite fast and if uh, and those that know the answer to the questions, where's Carol? Carol? Carol and Joy Carol. are supposed to answer. Those that know the answer to the questions, don't answer them. Joy? Everybody point at those two. I know enough about it. We just like to be good students. Yeah, we know you're good students. And uh, just uh, if you have questions, just write them down. If you have input, please uh, write it down. Uh, uh, see me afterwards. As a matter of fact, tomorrow morning, are we? Yes, 8.30, breakfast. Just let me know by 8 if you're coming. We uh, And it's just not breakfast. It's We sit around the... I was telling Joy on the way here, says, man, I have just missed the Sunday morning at the Sundays. <laughs> Sunday at the Sundays. And one of these days we're going to have Sundays <laughs> on Sunday on the at the Sundays. 
to have ice cream Sundays on Sunday the day at the home of the Sundays. That means we'll have to have breakfast that will last me for lunch. <laughs> what, what's so fun about our breakfast on, the, uh, on Sundays at the Sundays is that people will come back from our Saturday night and, and we, we get into great, great conversations uh, about the Word and people ask questions and we talk about things that normally can't be talked about, you know, on a Sunday morning service and uh, you're scared to even ask somebody, you're scared to get kicked out of the church for such a radical question. And uh, these are the things we talk about on Sunday morning and uh, it turns out to be quite, quite fun. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> and they last uh, as long as you want them to. Up to five hours. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, we, and we draw the line at that. Yeah. <laughs> we draw the line at that Sunday afternoon now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, so uh, we just, we, again, we want Jesus to get bigger, the resurrection to be more effective. This, uh, if you, we were to title this anything, it would be called This Is That. Matter of fact, you're going to see that we're going to go back to the, uh, uh, the book of Genesis. We're going to go through the Scriptures. Matter of fact, the first word in the first verse, in the first book, in the first chapter of the Bible, there is a prophecy mentioned. It's, it's called the bear of sheep prophecy. But, and we're not going to get into that in detail because we don't have that kind of time. But just to let you know, the, the concept of, of tonight's teaching is that this day, this season, the right now, is that what it was talking about. You understand that? So the that in Genesis, the first book, the first chapter, the first verse, the first word in the Bible, this season is what that was talking about. And we're going to go through the Scripture talking about this is that. Does everybody have that? Okay. Only on Sunday. <laughs> Only on Sunday. Uh, just to let you know, a lot of the teachings, most everything we're going to share is coming out of the Word of God. There's also some help books that we've gleaned from. They're Jewish books. One is called the Talmud. Another one's the Mishnah, the Midrash. And there's actually a, a history book uh, uh, by Josephus called The Antiquities of the Jews. And uh, some of the information comes from that. And what we try to do, and what we're going to do tonight, this afternoon is bring in the Jewish culture uh, in these different books that, they, that we can glean from. See, the Bible gives us an idea of what the different feasts were, but you realize they did more in the feast than what, just what we can read in the book of Leviticus. There's much more about what they were required to do and what symbolically things represent. And so we're going to talk about those things. And uh, so this is, this is that. Uh, for, for instance, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, just to give you an idea, real quickly, we're going to do these real quick. Revelation 13, verse 8. Uh, who's got a good reading voice? Because I can't turn around. All and who dwell read this. on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The Lamb, see, when, when was, or where was Jesus crucified? Say at Calvary. Calvary. But when was He slain? Before the, Before, the Before the world was even created, God had already established the fact that Jesus was crucified. So in other words, what do we get from that? That God doesn't do something on earth that He hasn't already finished in Himself. But guess what? To this period of time that we're celebrating every year, called Resurrection Season. We don't call it Easter. We call it Resurrection Season. This is more than Easter. It's more than bunnies. And eggs. This is that. This is that day, that season, those three days, this is the event that was before the foundations of the world was established. It was in God. This is that. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. That's another verse talking about what was done before the foundations of the world. And this verse says it was the works that Jesus fulfilled. As soon as that gets up there, someone read it. 
For we have believed to enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. So before the foundations of the world, the works that were Jesus fulfilled on this resurrection season that we celebrate every year, this season is yeah. that. That was established before the foundations of the world. And wait till you see the puzzle pieces that come together to make this more than just what we've heard. It's more than just this, this, and this. Palm Sunday is much more than just Palm Sunday. Why do we call it Palm Sunday? We're going to get into, we're going to get into the history of where Palm Sunday started. Why it started. Why was Jesus on a donkey? We're going to get into all of these different things that most of us have never heard, but it is in Scripture. And it is in history. And it is in the culture. God gave the Jewish people seven feasts to do every year on a specific day in a specific time in a specific way. Three of those feasts were fulfilled. This is that. Passover. This is that. Unleavened bread. This is that. Feast of the first fruits. This is that. The Jewish people do this every year, but they don't see the Messiah. They don't see the final sacrifice. We're going to, we're going to show you tonight or this afternoon why Jesus was referred to as the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Passover Lamb, why He is the High Priest. He's all of these. And we're going to show you scriptures for that. This is that. And there's more. Genesis. Oh, we can't. Let, let's. Let, real quick. Gen, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. It talks about the sin at, at, in the garden. And uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 talks about the seed. Where the, there was a prophetic word that was given uh, that there was going to be a savior. Someone was the seed of the woman was going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And we're not going to get into that today because we know who the seed of the, the woman was. Amen. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do we know what the seed of the serpent was? Yeah. Does the serpent have seed? Yeah. The Bible tells us it is. Well, when you find out who was called the brood of vipers. <laughs> Who did Jesus say you were of the Father, your Father the devil? Pharisees. The Pharisees. See, I believe religion was the seed that the devil was going to, that its head was be crushed. This all started for me anyway. When I was back when I was younger in ministry. Uh, most of us, I look around, most of us here probably... Does everybody, raise your hand if you know what a dot-to-dot -dot is. You know that high-tech artwork that we did as a young child? See, I see people not raising their hand, but they're laughing. You probably still got your, got your A in class for doing dot-to-dot -dot in art. Star. Get a little star. You get a little star. But I, I don't know about you, but... There was hardly any of the dot to dots that I ever finished because once I realized what the shape was, I flipped the page. <laughs> yeah, so like this up here. That's a dot to dot. And I would do the dot to dot going from the dot one to dot two to dot three until I figured out. And see, that's almost the way we are with resurrection and Christmas and all these different periods of time is that we hear the same thing over and over. We just go, and how many times do you want to do the dot to dot? You don't want to. Every year you go back, no, no. Pretty soon, when you start trusting the Holy Spirit and letting Him teach you, things will start to be what colored in. See, once you realize what it is, pretty soon, the more information you have, the more alive that picture becomes. And not only did... See, you went from dot to dot to Crayola. And then you went from Crayola to, to charcoal pencils and you could shade them in. And pretty soon that picture is 3D. And it's stepping off the page and now it's affecting your heart. You see, and that's really what information has done for me via revelation. Yeah. You know, as you study the things in Scripture and you start seeing stuff and, and it's like, oh, how come I didn't? It's just, it's, it's the goodness of God working through. It's actually what we call repenting. 
It's changing the way we think. See, resurrection season is not about just Palm Sunday. Oh, there's so much more. I really hope that at the end of this evening, you'll walk away from here with more information that brings revelation to Jesus. See, information will just inform you. But revelation will empower you. And we want you to be empowered with Jesus, not doctrine. Not theology. I want you to go out of here with some kind of, oh, you're really real. You're really that good. You really have done what all the Bible has said you are. You really are who the Bible says you are. And if we haven't accomplished that, I I apologize ahead of time. And uh, for instance, the uh, the... I was reading on as a, as a pastor even. Uh, we pastored for 35 years. And uh, early in our pastor life, I, I was getting real, I don't want to say tired, but it seemed Palm Sunday was the same old, same old. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know about you, but you know, it just, it's a great story. It's a great, but there was, I, I, I started asking questions. And I, one of the first questions I asked the Holy Spirit, and by the way, it's okay to ask questions to the Holy Spirit. He can, he can handle it. I, I was concerned. Well, I was confused. Why were the priests out there when Jesus was coming in on the donkey with the, the disciples and this whole event that took place? I, the first question, that, why, why did they care? Has anybody ever asked that question? Have you ever just stopped and figured, huh? You know, they said, Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. And he said, what? If these disciples will be quiet, these what? Actually, it doesn't say rocks, it says stones. Yeah. See, Joy, if she hadn't already done it, she's putting a picture of the Mount of Olives. See, Jesus was in the middle. See, I used to think it was the little stump, the rocks on the, the dirt road. No, he was in the middle of a graveyard. He said, these stones will cry out. He wasn't talking about the little rocks and the pavement. He was talking about the Mount of Olives. He was in the middle of the Mount of Olives and the descent into Jerusalem. Wow. And this is where it started for me. Once I started seeing that, I went, no, wait a minute. What other neat nuggets? (laughs) What other kind of colors are the dot? Is the dot to dot going to start? You know what I'm saying? What's the Holy Spirit going to start doing here? And then I found out there, and we're going to get into this. I'm going to try to go in some kind of order. And even though I've got my little cards here. (laughs) No, why are you laughing, Brad? Because you know when I say some kind of order, you mean it's absolutely nothing, right? (laughs) All right. But we appreciate the try, the the effort. Well, I did put a lot of effort, but it never works out that that way. The rabbi trails. No, these are all, well, yeah, okay. Instead of rabbit trails, that's what they do. You know, so, so, some, of the, some of the things you also need to know, that you've heard the teaching on the palm leaves, but one of the things you need to understand, they were under Roman, uh, Roman control at the time, and they couldn't fly their flag. And so the palm leaves were actually their type of their flag that they were flying in the face of Rome. And we're going to get into that here in a second, but we're going to go back even further and talk about some other things. Because we're going to talk about why Jesus was on a donkey. We're going to talk about why His feet didn't touch the ground. We're going to talk about why He was... matter of fact, let's talk about that one right now. Why were they out there? Why were the priests out there to see Jesus coming in? Because for 15, any, every since, you know the difference between the tabernacle and the temple? Mm-hmm. Say tent, say building. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. tent, building. Every since they got the command to perform Passover from the very first. Does everybody understand Passover? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're not going to go back and talk about that because that's a type and shadow for what? <clears throat> Salvation. 
Let me make this perfectly clear. They were not saved by the sacrifice of the Lamb at Passover. The blood didn't save them at Passover. It was the application of the blood that saved them. So what do we get from that? Yes, Jesus has done a lot of things for us, but what do we have to do? We have to apply it to the doorpost of our hearts. See, that's the truth. Jesus, yes, He died. He, put, he shed His blood for all man's sin. But guess what? You have to apply what He's done to your heart before it can affect you. And so that's a type and shadow of our salvation. This goes all the way back. They were led by the Spirit, cloud by day, fire by night. They went through baptism through the Red Sea. They went through the Red Sea. Does everybody understand it? That's a type and shadow. That's the Passover event. Ever since that event took place, they were told by God through Moses to bring a lamb into their house to perform Passover. And I'm <laughs> forgive folks, I'm sorry. <laughs> they were they were told to bring a lamb into the house. And they were to take care of that lamb and inspect that lamb. It had to be spotless and blemish free. So everybody brought a lamb into their house to perform this Passover every since that first Passover. They did this every year. So when Jesus came into Jerusalem on Passover, this is God bringing His lamb into His house. Yeah! Now see, those are the connections we're going to make in this. There are so many of these that we just don't see. And so Jesus was, here again, why were the priests out there? Why was, man, if you read the events, they were, the guest, listen, the guesstimate of the number of people that were outside the eastern gate waiting for the Passover lamb. If the Passover lamb came in every year at this specific date and time on this specific event anywhere from 250,000 to 350,000 people were outside the gate of Jerusalem see, see, see in a movie we see 20 or 30 people out there. no within the seven feasts that God told the children of Israel to perform yearly on a regular basis three of them were what we know as uh, where they had to commute they had to come to Jerusalem to perform. And so everybody anywhere, if you were a man of any, you, everybody from Israel came to Jerusalem to perform these feasts. And the Passover was huge. Can you imagine a Macy's Day parade outside of the street, of, of the, the, the road that comes into the, the Golden Gates, the Eastern Gate of Jerusalem? Just imagine 250,000 people lined up all cheering, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. But this time, according to the book of John, they changed what they said. They said, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. We're going to get into that. Yeah, i got to wait on that one. So we're going to try to stick to the Lamb. See, Jesus, I believe, like other people believe, that Jesus was right behind the Passover lamb as the Passover lamb came in at Passover every year. And when I first was pondering this and asking the Holy Spirit to bring this information make it clear, I asked Him, I said, well, well I was wondering, I said, was Jesus in front of the Passover lamb or was He behind the Passover lamb? Well, he kind of just, you ever got this little, like, you ever been slapped by the Holy Spirit in a nice way? Like, wait, oh. come on, come on, come on. Jesus is the what? The final. Say final. final. I believe he was behind the Passover lamb. Why? Because there's not another one after him. He's the final sacrifice. And see, that's what the Scripture says. But we need to bring this all in. So for a thousand to fifteen hundred years, people would would line up outside the gate saying, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's a reason why He came in on a donkey. There's a reason why His feet didn't touch the ground. Uh, and we'll get into that. So, uh, matter of fact, uh, let's just go there. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. 
Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Where's my reader? Oh, reading. <laughs> now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. Okay, according just... to each man's need, you shall make your Go ahead. Just... count for the lamb. Yeah. So, this, gives you, this shows you in Scripture where Moses was told to tell the people to bring a lamb into their house. And does anybody know what month this was? Say the month Nisan. Nisan. This is Nisan 10. So we know that Jesus came into Jerusalem along with the Passover lamb. On the Passover <coughs> lamb came in on every Nisan, the tenth of Nisan. And so we know this event was taking place on the tenth of Nisan. Does everybody know when Jesus was crucified? On the fourteenth of Nisan. Okay, and you'll see why these numbers are important as we go along this afternoon. Because it all fits together. It has to work. You know, God is so precise. Yeah. Very you know, God is so precise. You, you will be blown away this afternoon on what you hear about how precise our Father God is in the way He told the Jews to do what they did and the way Jesus did what He did to fulfill not just being the Lamb, but being our priest, our high priest, our King, the Messiah. He did it all. The final sacrifice... I don't know if we want to go that far back. Sure we do. Sure we do. We have all night. No, we don't have all night. Because you you plan on cooking, warming everything up. Let's talk about Jesus being the Passover lamb. Uh, does anybody know where the Passover lambs were created? Let me just add, let me say there were, there was an area between cities between uh, Jerusalem and Bethlehem yeah. called the country. Uh, the country in, in, the, uh, in the Greek, the Hebrew word for country literally means land between limits, city limits. So there was about five miles between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And the Passover lambs every year, every Passover lamb, just not every Passover lamb, but listen to this, every lamb that was used for sacrifice had to be spotless, blemished, and approved by Levitical shepherds. These weren't the dumbest of the dumbest people that could, couldn't find a job doing anything else. These were the smartest, best trained Levitical from the tribe of Levi, shepherds, that looked for and qualified and certified all the lambs that were to be sacrificed. They had to be spotless and blemish free. Just for your information, in the Jewish calendar, is 360 days in a Jewish calendar. According to the book of Leviticus, your book of Leviticus in your Bible, it says they had to have two sacrifices of perfect lambs a day, and that's called a continual sacrifice. So if you take 360 days times two, 720 lambs a year, perfect, approved by Levitical shepherds, had to be produced just to fulfill the daily sacrifice, not including all the other sacrifices that people had to perform. You're talking about a very, very large ranch. Yeah. Wow. According to the Mishnah, that that could only be, the Passover lambs could only be birthed within six miles to Jerusalem. They couldn't be any further than that. And Jesus was, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem. But more than just Bethlehem, there was one place that all these lambs were birthed. It's called the Migdala Dare. You're trying hard, aren't you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's all right. Got a little echo over here in the corner. It's, <laughs> it's, so called, exciting. it's called the it is. It's called the Migdala Dare. This is the place where all of the Passover lambs and perfect lambs for sacrifice were produced 
and certified for the children of Israel through the Levitical shepherds. This is where Jesus was born. How do we know that? Because Jesus, we're not going to get into all the Christmas story, but we'll get in enough to make you interested. When the priests were to perform their feet, their, their duties in the temple, and their garments got soiled or damaged, they couldn't use them anymore, and they would take them off and strip them. They would destroy them by ripping their garments in strips. These strips were sent to the Magdala there, and those strips went from being used in the temple for the priest to wrap the lambs in what is called swaddling cloth. Oh, the shepherds abiding in the field. You'll find the babe wrapped in what? Swaddling. There's only one place in all of Israel, people. There were several Magdala there's. But there was only one that had swaddling cloths that came from the garments of the priests in the temple. And that was just north of Bethlehem in the country, the land between limits, called the Magdala Dare. This story goes all the way back. Why is this so important? Because it's, it tells us... Are we going to put Micah chapter 5, verse 2? Oh, did you have a picture up there? Mm -hmm. okay. Micah 5, verse 2. Where's my reader? But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. This is saying that Bethlehem was going to be the place that the Messiah, and we're not even going to get into what is known as the, the Targums. The word Targum is like commentary in English. The word Targum is a uh, Aramaic uh, uh, commentary uh, of the, the writings that they had at the time. And it literally says in all these places, it talks about the coming of the Messiah. Look, look at uh, uh, Micah chapter 4, verse 8. And this is where you see the Magdala there. And there's other places. We're not going to take time to read all these places. The word Migdal there means tower of the flock. Migdal Adair, tower. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Mary Magdalene. Guess where, guess where she came from? She came from a town called Magdal. Alright, we'll just leave that alone. Okay. Uh, re read this. And you, O tower of the flock. See the word tower of the flock. You look it up in any commentary, and you look it up in any word dictionary, and you're going to see the word Magdal Adair. The stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. And now, there's a story, and how far back does this go? There's, there's a story of uh, um, Rachel that is giving birth. She's on her way to Bethlehem. And on her way to, to give birth uh, to what we know as Benjamin, she is in a tower of the flock. Yeah. Right? She's in the tower of the <coughs> flock. And she gives birth, but she dies in that process. And they, right outside of the tower of the flock, they make a tomb for her. And it's called what? Rachel's tomb, which is there today. So this lets you know what area of Bethlehem, so just outside of Rachel's tomb, which is there today, there would have been a <coughs> Magdala there, a tower of the flock where the Passover lambs were all certified. It would have been in what was known as today the Field of the Shepherds. Has anybody ever been to Israel? You ever get through the field of the shepherds? Yeah. It would have been in that field, would have been this tower of the flock that this took place. So, again, why is that important? Rachel, do you know what the word Rachel means? <coughs> it means you. Not you, but an E-W-E. It means a female sheep. And she gave birth. The symbolism throughout the Scripture is absolutely huge. And we see that now... Last year, I think we got into the names of all the people that came from Jacob. 
And they're all names that mean different things. And when you put them in order, they actually spell out sentences. Yeah. It's, just, it's just amazing. So, But we're not going to do that because we have so much more to talk about. And um, talk about... <laughs> the uh, Back to the birth of Jesus, there's a... Uh, what we also need to understand is that uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, there was no room for them in the... Amen. That word in in the Greek is kataluma. The word kataluma literally means guest house. It doesn't mean a motel or just for a stranger. That's a, that's a Greek word called uh, pondakaya. Pondakaya is the word for guest house. And that's what's mentioned in Luke chapter 10 talking about the Good Samaritan. It says, and he took that, the Good Samaritan took the person and gave him to the innkeeper. And that's Pondakaya. But Cataluma is a guest house. It's a special place. And why wasn't there no room for them in the inn? Please don't tell me because there's so many people in town. Because that's not why it was. They had been shunned. They, they were what the scripture calls Tame. Uh, I shouldn't say that. The, the Jewish people had a word called Tame. It means unclean. The word Tehor means clean. Remember that word. You're going to get. You're going to need to know that when we get into the four messianic miracles that Jesus performed to prove he was the Messiah. Okay, and so they were tame. They were unclean. And uh, another thing that caused them not to have room. If they would have brought them in, it would have made the whole house unclean. Another reason is for her to give birth. Whenever someone is giving birth, or a woman is on her menstrual cycle, she's what? She's tame. She's unclean. And anything she sits in, or any it, wherever she goes, whatever she touches, makes that what? Tame also. It has to go through a period of cleansing. And so there was no place for her, number one, because they had been tame because of sin in their life. The supposed of sin. They didn't sin, but the people thought they had. Do you realize what would have happened to her if she would have stayed home with her family? Killed them. What was normal would have been she'd been stoned. She, that's why she had to get away to Elizabeth. She had to get and hang around someone that was ahead of her in the same type of miracle birth, miracle conception, I should say. And they they helped you. And what what that's what we need to do. We need to get around people of like faith, like experiences, and we need to support one another in the direction and the calling that God has us for to go in. What happens is God's called you to go this way, and you're still hanging around people going this way. You'll never go that way. Why? Because you'll hang around where you get your sufficiency. But my goodness, we can't get into that. That's a real rabbit trail. <laughs> rabbi trail. Rabbi trail. Rabbi trail. Rabbi trail. We won't talk about that. <laughs> the what? Jesus declared that He was the... Um, People say Jesus never said that He was the Messiah. In the Greek, there's two words that describe the word declared. One is a word that literally means to speak. The other one is to declare by deed or actions. And Joy's going to put on the, on the list, on the board here, a list of scriptures. If you want to just take a picture of this, we're not going to talk about these. But these are all... Just some of the places where Jesus declared by His actions, that Greek word is, and I've got it here, you got to excuse me, uh, 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 podaik inomi. I'm only going to do it once. Okay, That's the Greek word that means to declare by actions. And then you'll see one column is what He had done. And another column is what was said about Him afterwards. As in the book of Revelation that says... I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Is that in red letters in the book of Revelation? Yes! And he said it. My, my, my. Don't even get me started on that one. So many people, Muslims love to do he never declared. He never said he was the Son of God. Yes, he did. Read the whole book. He declared by his actions. We're going to talk about some of those actions. 
Jesus came in. And I, I, I don't want to go there. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They brought Him to the temple to be circumcised at eight, eight days old. Uh, the next time you hear about Jesus being in the temple was when He was how old? Does anybody know? Twelve, Twelve years old. There's, two, there's. We're not going to get. Don't let me, get, Joy. Don't let me get into this. There's three schoolings. Uh, any any boy in Israel up into six years old, uh, if he can quote the Book of Leviticus, uh, he gets to go into another school. Now remember, they don't read at this age. They're taught the Book of Leviticus from their, the men in the in their community, and if if they graduate, if they go from, if they're good enough to go from this school to the next school, this school is called the Bet Safar. Uh, the Bet Safar is a school that takes them from six years old to twelve years old, and at twelve years old they are inspected by other rabbis and they're judged on the information they know and the questions they ask. Do you get that? When Jesus was 12 years old, what was he being? Where was he at when he wasn't with his family? He was in the temple and what were they amazed at? The information he knew and the questions he asked. And the questions aren't, is God so big and make rocks so large you can't lift it? No, no. The question, see, a rabbi's job is not to answer questions like we think a pastor's job is in America. A rabbi's job is to ask a question to keep people thinking about the God that they've been talking about. How did Jesus answer questions? <laughs> With a question. And so, some of us believe, and I qualify that rule, some of us believe that Jesus was going through what was called the Bet Safar up until He was 12 years old. And the next time you hear about Jesus, and we're not going to get into all this, there's another school after that when you graduate from Bet Safar, you go into what's called a Bet Talmud. And the Bet Talmud goes from, it's an 18 year school, long school. It's called the School of the Rabbi for 18 years. Can anybody do some simple math? 12 and 18 is what? Right. When you get done, if you get finished with the best Talmud, you're 30 years old. How old was Jesus when He came onto the scene? Some of us believe that He was literally a rabbi with Samika. And that means there's two ways out of the Bet Talmud. It's a rabbi... Uh, meaning that you only, if you're just a rabbi, you can only say what your rabbi said, do what your rabbi do, and speak what your rabbi spoke. But if you're a rabbi with Samika, you could not change the law, but you could interpret the law. In other words, you may change the way it's applied instead of just. Why do so many people come to. Why did Peter call him master? Why did so many people come here? What the new master rabbi had said. There were only two when Jesus was alive. The last one died when he was 14 years old. So they had been out of a master rabbi for that many years. And when they come out of that school, guess how they get? And now, guess what leads them in part of the Jewish culture? Whenever some you got a major change in your life, either by a healing or a job, uh, 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 inheritance, or a graduation from a school of a rabbi, you get baptized. And at 30 years old, what's happening to Jesus when He's being baptized? Oh, He's being baptized by John the Baptist. And not only was He being baptized by John the Baptist, but this is when He was absolutely declaring. Actually, John the Baptist declared. You realize that Jerusalem had sent people a whole group of men, to not spy, but to check out any person that they thought was claiming to be the Messiah. They were looking. Does everybody understand that? This was not a surprise. They knew according to their prophecies, through the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, all the book of Isaiah, all these prophecies were saying, this is the season of the Messiah. He's coming. They literally went to John the Baptist and said, are you He? He said, no. But there He is. There He is. So 
So not only was Jesus, I mean, we'll talk about this, when a priest, when a high priest, <laughs> remember this stuff, because it, it, this all, I don't know how to do this organized wise. It's, it's too complicated for me. Uh, when, when, a high, when a high priest, you know, you know who a high priest trains to take his place? His son. And you know when his son takes his place, you, you know what he says? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What did they hear from heaven? And you're going to find out why he had to be our high priest. I can't wait. I'm going to mess up all I spent, I, Listen, I tried putting this in perfect order. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. <laughs> listen, does anybody know the the, the high priest was during the crucifixion? Yeah, what? Right. Caiaphas. Caiaphas. Okay. Literally in Scripture, it says when Jesus said what He said, Caiaphas ripped His garment. You know that verse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that verse? It's in there. He ripped His garment. Guess what it says in the book of Deuteronomy? That if a high priest ever ripped His garment, it disqualifies him from being high priest. <laughs> You don't understand. That's awesome. There was no one there to take the blood of the Lamb. The high priest is the one that took and offered the blood of the Passover Lamb into the temple. He had disqualified himself, but God had won. Yeah. Thank you. Still in. That's oh, we'll get into that later. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. That's good. That's good. Oh, you don't know how exciting I get over this. I, that's what I, you know, I mean, hours. I, I'm not an organized person. This is just, this is, God, just go for it. There's two. I'll go, when you're eating, I'll go back and see which ones I've missed, okay? <laughs> you know, G, Jesus, he's, the first part of his ministry said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who was he speaking to? The most religious people on the planet that all had an old covenant mindset. And what he was telling them is that in the new covenant, in the kingdom that's coming, in the kingdom that was foretold, it's going to be different than the old covenant. Yeah. That you wouldn't be able to... You have to change... You have to repent. Amen. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You've got to change the way you think. Six verses later, he went through all Galilee. You know how big that area is? Preaching in every synagogue. Say every synagogue. Every. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven. He didn't teach the history of the Jews. Oh, there's a hush in this house, isn't it? He taught the king, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of heaven. How did he get in every church? Every synagogue. In all. Unless he was a Master Rabbi. Rabbi that had authority. Wow. See, this this begins to this just remember, we're not teaching doctrine and theology. I just want you to understand how great Jesus really is. He's awesome. So much so when he went to his own hometown. He walked into the synagogue and he picked up... They, uh, would they let anybody just come in and read the book of Isaiah? No! You had to qualify to read it in the synagogue. But guess what? He walks in and what do they do? Oh, please come read the daily reading of the book of Isaiah. And what does he read? Everybody knows what he reads. And they the, read what that read what the scripture says in that passage of scripture. It says they all marveled at his words, but then he did something to really tick them off. Does anybody know, remember what he did? Yes. He sat down. Now he didn't go back on the front row and sit where all the pastors sit. There were two chairs in every synagogue. The one chair had never been sat in. It was called the seat of Moses. 
For the common phrase was the seat of the Messiah. And he sat down in the seat of the Messiah. So not only did he read what the Messiah was going to do and say, today this scripture has come to pass. And then he what? Sits down in the seat of the Messiah that to declare he was the Messiah. Convert a pen Wow. Jesus is so cool. <laughs> He's in their face. He was declaring. And his entire ministry after that. Now, everybody, we're not, we don't have time to get into everything Jesus did, but there's some things you need to understand that he did on purpose. John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus, said, Are you he? That, and he already said he was, but he said, I think, for a purpose. And what did Jesus tell the disciples? Go tell John. Go tell him you see the blind, see. The death, or the demons cast. There, there's things that he did that they knew that the Messiah would do. Jesus performed four messianic miracles in his short lifetime of ministry. One of those was, one of the first messianic miracles was uh, uh, casting out a demon of a deaf mute. Do you realize they had de they were they had known of demon possession and casting out demons before Jesus got there, but they had to know the name of the demon so they could cast it out. So they believed that the Messiah would be the only one that could would be able to cast out a demon of a deaf mute. Why? Because you ask they couldn't speak the name of the demon, but the Messiah would be able to overcome that. And so when Jesus cast out the demon of the deaf mute person that had the demon in them, that was a messianic miracle. Now you need to remember that they had Jerusalem had people following Jesus around. It just wasn't his lovely believers, but they had an entourage of, from Jerusalem, from the temple, checking out everything that he was doing because everybody believed that he was the Messiah at that time. Any time in Scripture you see or hear someone say, Son of David! is a declaration of Jesus being, or that person being the Messiah. They might as well be saying, Messiah! So whenever you see that in Scripture, that is someone that is believing that Jesus is the Messiah. The next thing that Jesus did was heal a person blind from birth. Why is blind people have been healed before? Their, their sight had come back, but not someone that was blind from birth because blind from birth means they didn't have any eyeballs to see with. In other words, other healings were, were cataracts being removed and things like that, but they had the eyeballs in their eyes and they still could see. Or, you know, they had seen and they didn't see, but blind from birth means they didn't have eyeballs. And so what did Jesus do? Took up a little dirt, spit in it, stuck this stick it. Because see, the Creator could recreate what He created in the beginning. So only the Messiah could heal someone blind from birth. Now before we go to the other two that are major important, I like talking about this one. Does anybody understand the, the, uh, the story of uh, Jairus? Does everybody know Jairus? Jesus comes back to shore. Uh, I got that in here somewhere. Um, oh, the father old daughter. Yeah, what what verse is it though? I have it here and I know I just can't read it. But anyway. Mark five. Anyway, Jesus is coming to shore and there's a whole group of people there. And Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue in that area, has a daughter, a young daughter daughter of how old? Now, you don't know that until the very end of the, the story because it tells you how old she was. But So he has a young daughter who was on the verge of death and Jairus comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, come and heal my daughter. Keep her from dying. And so Jesus says, okay. And they turn and they go to Jairus' house to heal his daughter. But on his way there, this lady reaches up to him and touches the hem of his garment. 
And we know it was an older lady with an issue of blood for how long? Twelve years. So this lady had an issue of blood for twelve years. Everybody say twelve years. And what you need to know is this is called a, a talit. This is a Hebrew or Jewish prayer shawl. And now I'm not going to wear it because it gets very hot underneath here. But this is what they would wear or something just like this. And you'll see some that some are white and some have blue threads. Okay? Oh, you're not going to take a picture of this. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is a prayer shawl. And Jesus, all Jewish people would have had, even today, they, they wear some semblance of this on their body if they're Orthodox Jews. Um, but let me, let me tell you what this is. Uh, I, I believe it's in Micah chapter 4, verse 2. Uh, let's go ahead. And, oh, Malachi, excuse me. Malachi. This is called a tallit. And there's different portions of it. For simplicity, of the corners are called the kanaf. Does everybody see the kanaf? Yeah. This material here is the same material that's up here. And they would never wear it this way. They would always wear it on this on the outside. And this is the, called the kanaf. And this, this is a fun word. This is called a zit zit. Zit zit. I mean, kind of word, that's a fun word, isn't it? A zit zit. That's almost easy to remember. And everything on here is symbolic. This actually represents the tent. Uh, the tabernacle. The, this is a tallit. That represents the tent of tabernacle. Talit and tabernacle. Matter of fact, it's the same root word. Tent and tabernacle. Talit. It's all the basic same, same word. And what did they do in the tabernacle? See, before they had a building, that's where they went to worship God. And it also represents the, if you hold it this way, the, the veil of the temple. And so it represents the veil of the temple and the tent. Not, not hundreds of thousands of people can't get into the tabernacle to worship. So everybody had one of these. So when they put it over their head, they were in the presence of God. The Photoshop. No, but no. So does everybody see the semblance of this? Mm -hmm. This gave them their personal one-man tent, them and God, and they would make their prayers. And they had a certain way that they wrapped. Uh, we're not going to get into all that. Uh, this hand would come over here, and this hand would come over. And what's really fun is this right here. Because when they wore this, uh, what's that say in Malachi? But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in His wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like a oh, yeah. Can you see the wings? Mm -hmm. The wings, the word wings is actually the word talit. Mm -hmm. It's the corners. Though Some people say, well, He touched the hem of His garment. No. She touched the talit. Because of this verse. <coughs> She knew she had spent all of her money. Uh, I don't know if you can put that. I can. We don't have time to turn to all these scriptures. I'm sorry. You can look them up. Uh, she had spent all of her money looking at going to all the doctors, and she had ran out of money, and she's getting worse. And she comes up to Jesus. Now she has an issue of blood, people. What does that make her? Tame. Now, just like someone of. Uh, leprosy, a person that leprosy, if they come amongst someone that is tehor, that's clean, they're supposed to announce, Tame! Tame! So people would have a chance to back away from them so they wouldn't be touched. Because if a person that's Tame touches somebody that's tehor, the tehor doesn't make the Tame clean, but the Tame makes the tehor clean, unclean. 
And so there, she was supposed to be saying, Tamay, Tamay, but she's in the midst of all these other people trying to get a touch of Jesus. And she pushes her way through the crowd to get up close enough to touch the hem of His garment. Because why? Because the Bible says the Word that she was raised in, the Word of God, according to their Scripture, says the Messiah would have healing in His kanaf. Wow. I love this story. This is really a cool story. I wish I had time to get into more detail. I don't. But... What's really fun about this, Jesus felt virtue flow out of him the moment she touched his because she believed he was the Messiah. And he was the Messiah. So that proved that he was the Messiah when she touched his kanaf. And Jesus turns around and says, Now, I, I don't know about you, but I think Jesus knew exactly who touched him. But he wanted other people to know. Who touched him? Why? Because he knew that they knew that she was Tame. And she had just pushed her way through the crowd, not saying Tame. And the Bible says that she turned in fear of what was about to happen. What was she afraid that was about to happen? She was going to be stoned to death according to the law. But Jesus had another reason. Because He wanted them to know that Tamay had touched Him, being Tehor, which made Him what? Unclean. In their eyes. Isn't that something? See, they knew when a Tamay touched Tehor, that pe person that was Tehor just became... Tamay. And I love this part of the Scripture where it says, Jesus turned to her and she was fearful of what was going to happen. And he said, she said, your faith has made you well. In other words, she was now Tehor. <coughs> she was clean. But then the Scripture says, she told him the whole story. <laughs> now, if it had been a guy... Yeah, the guy would have said, hey, I got sick 12 years ago. Boom, you healed me. Great, thank you, man. But a woman. Well, 12 years ago, I was walking and I had my medical cycle and I just bud stopped and I went to this doctor and told him the whole story. <laughs> that sounds familiar. That's in natural. Women love to tell the whole story. Guys, we just grunt. Uh, uh, okay, good. I look at David. Go, David, uh, he goes, uh, we're done. You know, next. You know, just the way. That's a joke, people. So she's healed. Now here, now see, we're not getting to the good part of this yet. So now they turn and go to Jairus's house. On their way there, the servants come rushing out, going, "Stop!" Don't bother! She's dead! That's real pastoral. See, directly to the point. But why were they so abrupt and to the point? Because it was it, for a Tame, excuse me, for a Tehor to walk into a house that is now Tame because a dead person makes the whole house dead, yeah. unclean. Stop! Now, they didn't hear what the rest of the crowd heard. But Jairus did. And so Jairus and Jesus go walking in. Remember, Jesus is wearing one of these. Okay? He's wearing one of these. And not only... See, this right here, the seat seat, there's five knots in the, in the seat seat. One, two, three, four, and five. To the Jewish person, this represents the first five books of the Bible. The first five books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There's four spaces in between those five knots. It represents, each, each space represents the letter that they're not supposed to say the name of God. Yud, Heb, Vav, Hey. 
So, and they would wrap this <coughs> in a certain way around their hand. And not only were they in the... This is a continual reminder of the ways of God, the Word of God, the promise of God, the provision of God, mm. the personal presence of God. Mm. They, they put this on every day. Every, mm. every morning they woke up to remind them to walk in the presence, in the person, in the Word of God, the promises of God, the healing of God, the, the, everything about God, His Word, His judgments. This was a reminder. And so when they walked into the house... I love this verse. It says, when they went into the house, Jesus kicked out everybody that was... He said, oh, she's just sleeping. And what they do? They ridiculed him. He said, get out. That'll preach. You ever been in a situation where you need to stand in faith and there are people around you going, oh, you can't believe that word of faith message. Quit that confession stuff. Healing's not for today. Get those people out! Yeah. He kicked them out. Yeah. When was the last time you kicked someone out? Uh, oh, yeah, we're supposed to be in unity. Not with people that don't believe. Amen. Give me some kind of religious break. <laughs> so what did Jesus do? She, he reached out with His right hand and touched her in the Word of God, the ways of God. The promises of God, the names of God, the healing of God, the prosperity of God. And lifted her up. Yes. Now, there's so much more to this story, but we can't dwell on it. But one thing we can dwell on, let's see if you caught anything. Some of you may have, because you've already heard this before. Let's just see what happens into your heart. How old was she? Twelve. How old was the woman with the issue of blood? How long did she have the issue of blood? How many tribes of Israel are there? How many old tribes of Israel? Twelve. What was their issue all their life? Blood. Blood had to be shed. Their entire existence for the sacrifice of sin. Wait a minute. Are you saying that maybe the woman with the issue of blood represents the 12 tribes of Israel who all their existence had to have sacrifice of blood to pay for the price of sin. Old covenant, say yes. yes. But that only works if the young girl of how old? 12. How many disciples were there? 12. See, the issue of the blood had to stop before the church could come forth. The old had to come to an end before the new could begin. Wow. She came alive. See, the issue of the blood is over at Calvary. Jesus hung on the cross, and we're going to get into this later. <laughs> it is finished. He didn't say, I am. He said, It is. Something came to an end. And it was the issue of blood at the final sacrifice of the last sacrifice. Wow. There's so much. We hadn't even... We had... I'm sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> Oh, just just to let you know. Here's a see. This is what good notes. I almost forgot this. The the zit zit. There's eight strands. You see the eight strands here. Mm -hmm. And actually, when they get up in the morning, they would straighten each one of these so they wouldn't cross. Mm -hmm. That's how precise they were. And notice there's a blue one. It represents the Messiah. But you realize for years they didn't have blue dye. It was a specific kind of dye. Just in recent he history have they started putting the blue back in because they found the shellfish that the blue dye comes from. Really? That's why you see some that are just white. And that's okay. And then some that have the blue. It represents the Messiah. But there's five knots. Right? There's eight 
strings. Five and eight is what? Number wise. Thirteen. The word talit in the Jewish language, every letter has a numerical number to it. Alpha is one, bet is two, and so forth. Twenty-two letters, twenty-two numbers. The word talit, or zitzit, excuse me, the word zitzit, its number value is 600. So when you take the 600 of the numerical value and the five knots and the eight strands, you have what? 613. Does anybody know how many laws? Oh, 613. 613 laws in the Old Covenant. This represents it all. Wow. Just fun stuff, isn't it? That's why I believe when Jesus would reach out and touch people, He touched them out with the promise, the provision, the personal, the private, the intimate. Caring love of God. Mm. So let's go back to the... I'll take this off. It is very hot. Let's go back to the other two Messianic miracles. One was, what we say, the blind. deaf mute, the blind from birth, and a person of leprosy. And so they believe that the Messiah, see, if a person that is Tehor touches someone that's Tame, it makes that person Tame. So a person could never touch someone with leprosy to bring healing or to make them Tame. But they knew that one of the works of the Holy or the Messiah would be that he would be able to heal those of leprosy. So the third Messianic miracle was when he healed the of leprosy and did not become Tame. The fourth one is one, probably one of the most unique and one that we don't really have understood for years, but it's to raise someone from the dead after, say after, after. three days. Now is there a story in the Bible that you refer to of someone that was raised from the dead specifically after three days? There's one. Lazarus was raised from the dead. After, do you know how the story goes? Just in a, just in a, and you can go home and read all this. We were going to turn, but we just, I get too lost trying to do that. Jesus, 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 come, my brother, the one that you love, Lazarus, he's sick to death. Come and heal him. And what's Jesus do? He laughs. He laughs. Okay, uh, I'll show up later. And it wasn't until after he's dead that Jesus shows up on the fourth day after he died. And what does he do? So you've heard all the great stories about yes, you know that 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 they needed they knew Jesus as healer, but they needed to know him as the resurrection. Yeah, and that's a great way to preach it. There's nothing wrong with that. But to understand that he was fulfilling the last and most important messianic miracle to declare that he was. Why did he wait? The scripture literally says, this is for the glory of God. Yeah. I thought all healing, I thought all people being raised from the dead was for the glory of God. No, this one was for the glory. This was the, this was to let everybody know I am the Messiah. Whoa. Man, that is so cool. You'll need to know that a little bit later. He's king. So we talked about him being the Messiah. Now he's king. Put first Kings chapter one verse verse thirty three. Joy on the board. And my reader get ready. First Kings chapter one verse three thirty three. This is where the bringing a king in the city starts. We've already talked about where the lamb was brought into the city, into the house. This is God's lamb brought into His house at Passover. The lambs were brought into the house. Is the it up king, there? The king also said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule, and take him down to Gion. 
This is where it started. This is where bringing a king on a donkey starts. What you need to understand is that when a king comes into a city, he comes in one of two ways. On a horse, then it's an act of war or dominancy. Or if it's on a donkey, it's in the sign of a peace. And the very track that they, this, God, he went right through the valley, right into the eastern portion of the city. This was the, what they had been doing every year when they're in Jerusalem. This is the way the king would come into the city. David was initiating his son as king into the city, coming on a donkey in the atmosphere of peace. So when Jesus comes into the city on a donkey, being a king, matter of fact, in the book of John it says, oh gosh, in the book of John it says, blessed is he, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, we... Oh, I'm blow my notes here. What, what, what we need to understand is that during the time of Christ, there was a guy named Caesar in Rome. He was in charge of all of the empire of Rome, and he had put certain people in charge over Jerusalem. One of those was King Herod, that when Jesus was born, the one that killed all the babies. Well, he died. And he had many children, but he killed a lot of them because he was scared they were going to get take his throne. But there were three young men that he didn't kill, and he divided up Israel in three sections. Uh, and uh, one was called Philip. We, we won't get into all that. Goodness gracious. But there was one, Herod Antisipus. He was in the region of Judea, the, the, of Jerusalem, but he had made such a mess of his ruling and reigning in Judea that he got kicked out of his authority and God had to appoint Pilate to take his place. Pilate was a Roman in Judea that now was overseeing this situation with Jesus. Does everybody understand that? That's how Pilate got into the situation. So, so Pilate... His jo only job was, in his region, was to squelch any sign of rebellion. You need to understand, Jerusalem has never been worshipped by just... What? I always thought Jerusalem was always... Well, I always believed everybody there was Jews. No. Many different religions were there. And the, the Romans didn't care what religion you worshipped or how you worshipped, what you did when you worshipped. As long as you worship Caesar first. Does everybody understand that? You could worship any deity. It's numbers, but you had to declare that Caesar was the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and you did it by paying money. That's how you did it. And so at this period of time, every year... Pilate would come in anytime there was a large group of people meeting and he'd be listening for anarchy. Pilate would come in. Do you have the, the picture of Jerusalem up there yet? Of the town of Jerusalem? Yeah. People, uh, Pilate would come in. Uh, Bruce, can you get my pointer right there? I'm all set up. That, that long stick, the big one. The that Texas, Texas pointer. pointer. Just slide it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you go. That's a pointer. That's a Texas side pointer. Okay. This is where Jesus would have been coming in at. And at the same time, Jesus, excuse me, every year the Passover lamb would come in this way. Every year, now last year I said something I shouldn't have said because I was just. I learned different this last year, okay? I used to say Pilate was coming in over here because that's Gehenna. That's a whole other issue. But Pilate was coming in this gate here. It's the the it's where all the merchants would come in. This was the bit the chief gate, or what is known today as the Jaffa gate. And this is where anybody that traded anything would come in the main so just opposite of where Jesus Pilate would be coming in and he'd be looking and listening for any signs of anarchy. And he'd be coming in with what is known as a cohort. Do you know what a cohort is? 
Does anybody know what a Roman legion is? You're talking like 64,000 troops. A cohort is just a piece of that of 200 and, excuse me, 480 soldiers. So Pilate, Pilate was coming in here with 480 soldiers, which is a cohort, coming in, and they were listening for anything that sounded like anarchy. And they'd come in riding on what is known as a war horse. There's the picture of the war horse. And he'd have a stick. And on top of that stick, they'd have what is known as an aquila. Everybody's ever seen Roman movies on TV? They always had an aquila. You know the stories about the, the, the one uh, uh, group of people that lost the Aquila in the battle. And anyway, we'll get into that. The Aquila was a sign of Rome's domination. Anytime you see an eagle on a stick or a flagpole, <laughs> it's a sign of domination. And they would come in the Jaffa gate, the chief gate, and whenever someone was worshiping anybody or anything, they'd hold this out like this, and they would have to stop their worship, turn and bow to surrender to Caesar. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging that Caesar, wait a minute, I'll worship my God in a second. I've got to worship the God of gods. So every year at Passover, they would come through and be doing this all over Jerusalem to get people to bow down to Caesar. And if they didn't, they'd all be killed. See, Caesar was from a place called Caesarea by the Sea. When you see the, there's two towns, Caesarea by the sea and Caesarea Philippi. What was one of the other rulers that was placed from Herod? Philip. Philip. And he wanted to please Caesar, so he made a really nice, at the foot of Mount Hermon, a place called Caesarea Philip. He threw his name in there with Caesar. See that? Mm -hmm. Caesarea Philippi. But Pilate lived at a place on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea called Caesarea by the sea. Caesar by the sea. And he'd only the only job he had was to squelch rebellion. And so when Jesus was coming in and all of His disciples, and you had 250,000 people outside, and they used to say, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Stop right there for a second. Zechariah 9.9. You need to read this. This is what they said every year. We're talking about for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Where's my reader? Read this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your King is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey. Stop. Okay, go ahead. Colt, the fall of the donkey. Does this sound like what Jesus was doing? Yeah, yeah. But see, they had four ways of teaching in, in the Jewish culture. The simplest way is called a romance. See, you can't be guilty. See, if you quoted the Scripture, a, a, a full Scripture, you could be found guilty for quoting a Scripture that sounded like an artist. But if you just quoted part of it, let, let me, it's called a romance. Let me just do it this way. Uh, for God so loved the world, He... Gave gave the that's whoever... So, neither one of us quoted the whole scripture. So we're not guilty. It's called a romance. Look at verse 10. This is what they didn't quote out loud. But this is what they knew. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nation. <laughs> Listen, if Pilate is coming in, Ephraim is just to the north of Jerusalem, and this is the, the slang word for the gate, is the gate of Ephraim. So you have a battle bow of a king coming in on that gate, the chariot, and the, wait, they've been saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now they're saying, blessed is the king Yay. who comes in the name of the Lord. If they would have kept reading and quoting, do you think Pilate would have had an issue? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, but they weren't guilty. So the priest, for two reasons, said, Shh! Quiet! Don't say the rest. <laughs> the people were saying, Blessed is he, but the disciples were saying, Blessed is the king 
who comes in the name of the Lord. Not only was he behind the last Passover lamb, and he was getting all the attention that that lamb was supposed to have, Jesus was getting it. They were keeping everybody quiet so Pilate doesn't kill him. <laughs> Got a question? What did Jesus have? What did Jesus have the priest pull out of their pocket when they were in the temple? They pulled out a coin. Whose face was on the coin? Excuse me, not face. Whose image? Caesar's. That's when Jesus said, "Render unto." They had an idol in their pocket in the temple. One of the Ten Commandments is what? Don't have any graven image. And they had already surrendered their authority to the government. Does that sound familiar? Oh. Wow. There's just so much of this. Jesus comes in on a donkey to declare peace. Once he comes into Israel, and once he comes into Jerusalem, he establishes, excuse me, he tells the disciples to go prepare for the Passover meal. It's called the Seder meal. Anybody ever been involved in a Seder meal? Anybody ever heard of the Seder meal before? It actually made up of 15 steps. This is actually a meal, but it was a celebration within the meal. And there's 15 steps within the Seder meal. We're not going to go into all those, but today we happen to have what is called a matzah tosh. This is one of the steps of the Seder meal that Jesus would have done with His disciples in what is known as the Last Supper. It's the Seder meal during the Passover period of time. This is what is called a matzah tosh. That's a real fancy word for saying a, a matzah holder. <laughs> it sounds better. This matzah tosh is made up of three different compartments. One, two, and three. Does everybody see that? Yes. In the matzah tosh, it actually holds something called matzah. That's a, a legit piece of matzah. It looks like a giant saltine cracker. But I like it being big like this because it shows you what the Scripture talks about, which we're going to talk about as we get a little closer to lunch, dinner, supper, whatever you want to call it. Do you see the stripes? Yes. And if you hold it up to a light, do you see the piercings? Do you see that there's no leaven in it? This is a matzah. Alright? And what we... The what? Mozzarella. A mozzarella. <laughs> but this is the matzah tosh, and it would have three pieces of matzah in it. And during the Seder meal, Jesus held up this matzah. He was performing the Seder meal. Now, I find it very interesting. There's five steps, uh, 15 steps, that Jesus only took out two of the steps for the New Covenant believers. Oh. Not 15. See, if we were still under the law, we would have all 15 to do. But we're not under the law. The Mosaic law. We're under a new law. So, to a Jew, this represents God the Father, God the Son, the Messiah, and the God the Holy Spirit. The middle matzah is, represents the Messiah to a Jew. We represent, we understood it, stand it as what? The Son. So when Jesus took out the middle matzah during the Seder meal, He took out the middle one. And He said, This is My body. Let me say it in other words. This is Me. This is Me. And if you ever want to have a communion service like you've never had before, you need to get a hold of the, the eight different Scriptures we have that all pertain to communion that churches never read for communion. Matter of fact, let's just read one of those. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Just make it real quick. 
We're not going to get into the seven, the teaching. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. What? Well, well, through the what? Body. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of what I did in my body. What did he do in our body? Made us what? Restart it all over again. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. So we could be married to the one that was raised from the dead. Not servants, but a bride. Through the body of Christ and what he did at Calvary brought us into a whole new relationship that nobody had ever known before. The Apostle Paul calls it a mystery that had been hidden. And Jesus broke it. And he distributed it. They would take the large person and put it in What's the word for this one? Afrikoman. The Afrikoman. Now, it didn't have a zipper. And they'd take the Afrikoman and they would put the body, what they thought was the Messiah, we know it's his Christ, and they would hide it during the meal. And at the end of the meal, they'd send the children out to find it. And whoever found the... See, Jesus said, was Jesus' body buried? Yes. Come on now, put the pictures together. His body was buried. It was broken and buried. And anybody that found the body got the promise of the Father. Mm -hmm. This is what they this is what they did every every Seder meal. And what do we if you find Jesus, what do we get? The promise, the promise of, of the Father, which is what? Eternal life with Him. Amen. It's all symbolic. It's all a beautiful picture. Everything Jesus did. I hope this is making Jesus yeah. look bigger than you've ever seen him before. Yes. You've got the Seder meal. The 15 steps of the Seder meal. He took out two of the 15 to give it to the church, the new covenant. I love what it says about that. He, even at the, he took the cup. He said, take this cup in remembrance of me. It was the fourth cup of the Seder meal. There's 15 steps and four cups of wine. How many people can handle four cups of wine? <laughs> They started getting happy. Oh no, they weren't little tiny cups. Quit that in the back. <laughs> they were used to it though. And Jesus said, I'm not see this. He said, This is the cup of the what? New covenant. See, this was the middle of the old covenant, but now he was establishing a different truth under the what? New covenant. Oh. I so they're not. They're not drunk as you, you suppose, because it's, <laughs> it's the fourth cup. Right, they're not going to suppose, right? The, uh, there, there's so much for us to talk about. Now, we're going to, we're almost done with this section in here, so you can, you can go, whew, and you're going to eat, but we're not done. But after that, we start getting into the inspirational. So is it a distortion now when... Some folks send their kids out on Easter egg hunts. Is it like uh... that? We don't really want to get into that now. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a breakfast. Sunday, that's a Sunday morning. That's a Sunday morning. I, I love that, but we got so much more to talk about. But yeah, that's just totally. But you know, colored eggs started with Jewish people. Not there's one in the Seder meal. Okay, it all depends on what, how far back you want to go. But anyway, we won't get into that. That's, that's uh, so. Yeah. Write it down. So let's get back to Jesus. So Jesus has done this. Right after that, what happens to Jesus? Right after the, the, the Seder meal, what happens to Jesus? Where does He go? Do may know? He goes to the garden. Right? He goes to the garden. And there are certain things that happen in the garden. Now, I'm on... I don't know if I should. Remember this statement. I believe that Jesus and Adam, Adam in the garden, Jesus in the garden, I believe they looked alike. Where do I get that from? Adam was created in the image and the likeness. Jesus was the expressed image. How can I not think? Is it a big deal? No. 
But I think they did. <laughs> and you're going to find out why later on as we go through some of this. And this is one of them. This is one of the things. And I, I, don't, I can't do this here. I'll just go ahead and do it. <laughs> See, the first Adam, Jesus is known as what? The second Adam? No. Or the last Adam? Okay. The first Adam went into the garden this way. What do I mean by this way? He was told to eat of the fruit of the trees. Do you pick fruit? of trees down like this? No. Or do you pick fruit like this? No. Symbolism here, people. Work with me. Mm -hmm. Not doctrine. Not theology. But I'm talking about passion of Jesus. Okay? So he started out like this and when he sinned, yeah. we won't tell you how long it was he sinned, but we know. Some of us know. And he was, after he sinned, he went left the garden on his knees picking weeds and thorns, tilling the ground. Well, Jesus entered the garden on his knees. And left the garden like this. Symbolism. Did Jesus really see? Is this day that? Yes. Yes. You're going to find out later on that everything that happened in the garden was a testimony of what was happening that we're celebrating today the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Messiah. The King of kings and Lord of lords. The reason we're pausing now is because after we eat, then we're going to get into what is known as the, the bloody mess. I didn't want to get into the bloody mess before we ate. Wow. So Jesus is in the garden. And he asked, not, see, let's go back to the garden. Now, you don't hear this said, but it is symbolically said in what was done. Adam in the garden said, not your will. See, it was God's will for him not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Right? And so when he did, he was saying, not your will, but mine be done. And when Jesus was in the garden, He said, not mine, but yours be done. Oh, come on now. This is, you, you know, I'm just softening you up for the big stuff at the end. You don't want to leave after dinner. I don't care if you didn't like the brisket. You don't want to leave. This is just the informational portion. So, they're in the garden. Jesus is there. It's at night. And all of a sudden, you have this these temple soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. And what does Peter do when, 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 uh, when Judas kisses him on the cheek and they take you to arrest him? Peter steps up with a knife or a sword. Matter of fact, that Jesus told him to go by, by the way, to prepare him for this event. He went up to, to and he, he cut this guy's ear off, right? And everybody says he's trying to cut his head off and just miss. No. He, was, he, he would have broke one of the Ten Commandments. But he cut his ear off on purpose. Whose ear did he cut off? Who do you remember his name? His name is Malchus. Malchus was the servant of the high priest. Why is his name mentioned? Because he was the son of the high priest. He was the one whose future was going to be the high, his destiny, his purpose, his reason, his economy. Every, his whole heritage ahead of him was about becoming the high priest. And in the book of Leviticus, it says that a high priest or a priest in the tribe of Levi could only be a priest or high priest if he didn't have any facial deformities. And so when Peter realized that they were taking, see, Jesus was Peter's destiny. Jesus was Peter's future. Jesus was Peter's 
life. And they were taking Peter's life, so Peter reached out with the knife and said, you take mine, I'm going to take yours. This is what's really cool about the Jewish culture. They put themselves in every aspect of the teaching. So in this aspect, you've got to stop and ask yourself, are you Peter? Has someone done something to you and you went back and took it from them? And disqualified them? Have you done something to stop their future, stop their lineage, to stop their dreams? Have you made their life something other than what it was supposed to be? Or maybe, are you Malchus? Have you done something to someone else? Like to Peter? Or maybe, are you like Jesus? That reached down and took the ear and reestablished his purpose, his prosperity, his destiny, and everything he. Who are we supposed to be like? Malchus, the servant? Has someone done something to you? Disqualify you from ministry? Have you done something to you to disqualify you from ministry? Maybe we should let Jesus. Maybe we, the body of Christ, are supposed to be reaching down and helping people back into their purpose that God has planned for their life and reestablish them no matter what they've done to us. See, that's the message in the story. We're going to get back to the garden. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you give us to be here. I thank you for the information that's come forth. I, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you can make it work in people's hearts. I just ask right now that you bless the food that has been prepared. I bless the hands that have prepared it. And may we fellowship one with another, with the joy of the Lord. And prepare us for the rest to come. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining Pastor Curtis and Joy for this message. If you would like to hear more from Pastor Curtis or Joy, please check them out on their Coker Ministries YouTube channel. Also, please like and subscribe if these messages are a blessing to you. You can also visit their webpage at cokerministries.com. God bless you. Have a great day. This ministry functions on the support of our listeners. We appreciate your prayers and your financial blessings. Your support helps us to continue to share the message of grace, peace, Christ righteousness, and the finished work of the cross. You can give online or digitally at the Cash app. The name is Coker Ministry or Joy Coker. Also at Venmo at joy-coker. Or you could mail your support or prayer request to Coker Ministries, 15239 555th Avenue, Parkers Prairie, Minnesota, 56361. We pray God's blessings over you. Remember, if you are in Christ, you are blessed, highly favored so very deeply loved. Again, thank you for joining us in the Word. Be blessed.